Hi, and welcome. I'm your host, co-host, Siobhan Sarna. My other host is Dr. Allison Seebecker. Hi, Dr. Seebecker. Hello. And the star of the show, of course, today is SIBO, EMO, IBS, and the beloved and incredible Dr. Mark Pimentel coming to us live from Cedar sinai and the MAST program in the lab there, which is looking very high-tech and beautiful. Hello, sir. Hi, how are you? Hi. It's good to be here. Thank you so much. So for those of you who are gut health nerds uh, like we are, uh, and you're trying to figure out what's going on with your case, and maybe you attended this the Gut Rescue Summit where you saw Dr. Pimentel's and Dr. Seebecker's presentation, or you were just in our community and we just sent this to you and said, hey, come on over. We're doing something fun with Dr. Pimentel when it's a, it's a get, it's direct access. So thank you for being here. If anybody is not on that list, then certainly get into SIBOSOS.com, SIBOinfo.com, follow Dr. Pimentel on Twitter. Let's get to some questions. Dr. Pimentel is, now cover your ears for a second. He's the one that I believe is going to cure SIBO in the next few months. <laughs> no pressure, doctor. But he's the one who's responsible with his wonderful team for the elemental diet, for the discovery of how rifaximin works for SIBO, how they are uh, absolutely, as explorers, re or, or mapping the small intestine microbiome and on and on and on. I'm going to get some questions going, but before I do that, can you give us a quick update of the state of the research, sir? Oh, how long do you have? Well, um, I have hundreds as long of as you want. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to know that. Uh, well, I mean, the research is obviously continuing back here. We have grown. We're growing more. We're almost close to 30 people back here now. Um, and you know, what, what we're trying to do is continue to dig in, in, in terms of trying to understand the true organisms that are causing SIBO. So of course we have small intestinal overgrowth. We just published a paper just in January that shows that we know the two main characters, three main characters that it's E. coli and may even be just a single strain of E. coli that's contributing to the hydrogen. Klebsiella is part of that uh, SIBO. And then in terms of emo, intestinal methanogen overgrowth, uh, we've been looking at the organisms in stool and seeing that the organisms are proportional to the breath test, meaning the methanogens in stool. We have something coming out at DDW, which I, of course can't talk about yet, where we looked at the small bowel comparing that to breath test as well. And so I think uh, from the point of view of SIBO, EMO, and hydrogen sulfide, the new kid on the block, which I'm sure there'll be some questions about. By the time DDW comes, we will have for the first time a truly valid breath test because the first time the breath test has ever been validated all these decades against symptoms and against the microbiome was our paper in 2022 using the three gas breath test. So you could say based on that, that the three gas breath test is the most validated breath test in history, and that that's the first time breath testing has been properly validated in against the microbiome. I'm not saying things have changed because of that, but what I'm saying is we can say that this is, that the breath test is actually telling us what's going on in the gut. By the time DDW hits, it's going to be validated against all the characters of the small intestine as well. And so, and the numbers that you're seeing on hydrogen sulfide on the on this new test correlate directly with the hydrogen sulfide producers in the gut. So it's just proving the accuracy of the test. So getting all those nuts and bolts in place. I think what the next what the next part of this is, which is all happening at the same time, is now that we understand the cast of characters, the bad actors, we're developing therapies for each of those bad actors. And these will be things that are emerging in the coming weeks. Did you say weeks? Um, no, not weeks. Not an optimist. <laughs> hey, she gave you like two months to cure it. You know. I yeah. know this is always this always happens on this on this particular uh, recordings. Uh, I it, it, they're coming soon. Uh, we have them, if if that's a way to put it. But they have to go through a specific process of investigation. And so one of the things that. I, I want to just say over and over again today is you can't just give things to people. I mean, yes, you can, but we, we want to put data out there. That's what I'm trying to say. Our, our team is trying to say, okay, 
you know, we've got all this, let's, let's make sure that it is correct. We've got these treatments, let's make sure they work in a double blind study or in some kind of controlled trials so that, so that patients can be assured that this is a, based on a publication, based on science, based on, on um, proof that, that whatever we're doing is actually helping these particular organisms. Okay, so that's that's where we are so far, but obviously there's a lot of details. Well, and for everyone who is just going DDW, what is that? It's Digestive Disease Week. It's the largest gastroenterology conference, and it this year is in Washington, D.C., and it's in May. So Dr. Pimentel and Allison, Dr. Seebecker, and I will be back later on this year. We have our date already with Dr. Pimentel to <laughs> talk more about that, and bless you for that. Are you ready for some questions, sir? Always. Well, sometimes with you guys, the <laughs> questions are the questions are tougher with you guys. <laughs> Thank you. If a patient's SIBO is caused by adhesions, is it likely that they will have best results with permanent prokinetic therapy? Uh, so uh, tricky uh, with that because you know the prokinetics have a warning that if you have a very critical adhesion pushing against a critical adhesion can cause more pain, right? So it depends on the adhesion, the degree of the adhesion. And so you have to just caution the patient if they're going to take a prokinetic and they have an adhesion, if it causes more pain, just stop it right away. Um, so just be careful with that. I've had the norovirus for several months that I can't shed even after being treated for SIBO. Have you ever heard of this and why my immune system can't clear it? Terrible symptoms of stomach pain and systemic misery. Oh, we're sorry. Yeah, the norovirus thing is a is a bit of an epidemic here on especially on the west coast now. Um it's it's sort of a thing that has to run its course. I, I I don't know if they're saying that they're still testing positive for it. Is that what I'm understanding or they're having some yeah. lingering symptoms? Yeah. Either way, it's it just has to run its course. It's pretty nasty though. Okay. What has been your experience solely using augmentin for treating emo? And if you all don't know what these terms are, don't worry. We've got tons of support materials for you. And you can watch Dr. Pimentel's presentation from the Gut Rescue Summit um, about using Augmentin for treating emo. Also, your experience is strictly using the elemental diet for emo. Yeah. So uh, in terms of Augmentin for emo, it does work for some patients. Um, I reflect back on a study we did more than a decade ago <clears throat> that we we see that when we give absorbed antibiotics or typical antibiotics like Augmentin or those types of things, we do see benefits equivalent in some cases to Rifaximin, for example. What we did end up seeing that was the problem is that after you've taken it once and it worked, if you had a recurrence and tried to take it again, almost 66% of people who tried to get better again, it wouldn't work a second time because resistance was developing. Um, I think it's at DDW this year, uh, but we we have a, a measure of the amount of resistant organisms in the small intestine. I know we have the data already, I've seen it. Uh, and um, it's amazing how much resistant bacteria there are in the small intestine to the typical bacteria but they don't get resistant to rifaximin. So you'll see a little bit more of that come May. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for those of us with chronic <laughs> reflux issues and permanently eliminating all antacids and PPIs, but it's not always successful? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, you uh, can you ask that question e again? Because yeah, it's yeah. a- If you have emo and chronic reflux, yeah. how do you assist those <laughs> patients when they're trying to avoid taking a PPI? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, taking a PPI helps emo. We see less methane in people on PPI because less acid means less hydrogen for methane production. So uh, I know people are trying to avoid drugs and medications, but but PPIs can be helpful for both things at once a little bit. Um, but what we do see and what we try to do is to get rid of the emo if we can, emo meaning intestinal methanogen overgrowth, because emo slows the gut down. If your gut is slow, you get back pressure. If you get back pressure, you have more reflux. So um, uh, getting rid of emo is worth a try before starting the reflux medications because maybe your reflux gets better just by treating emo. Nice, that's hopeful. I've, sure. I've seen that a number of times. Wow, okay. As someone with SIBO and post-infectious IBS, 
how can I protect my gut if I'm required to take antibiotics for like a different infection, like tooth or UTI or something? Yeah, so antibiotics, regardless of the type, will have some beneficial effect on SIBO. You know, there, we, we don't think SIBO comes because you took an antibiotic in the past. Um, although there's a little bit of data saying maybe that's not exactly true, but I don't want to get into sort of the weeds of that. There's a lot of things to discuss on that. Um, but but if you take an antibiotic for a urinary tract infection, you're going to make the SIBO less. If you take an antibiotic for a lung infection, you're going to make the SIBO less. Uh, so I don't worry necessarily about the antibiotics. What you don't want to do is if you've had C. diff, which is a type of infection in the colon caused by antibiotic use, then you got to be very careful in what antibiotic you choose in that predicament, but not for SIBO. Have you seen SIBO on celiacs due to small intestine lining damage? Uh, we see SIBO in refractory celiac often. Um, and, and so the patients are all absolutely 100% gluten-free or 99.9% .9 gluten-free, and they have residual symptoms. And then you treat SIBO in them, and then they get to that full resolution or that, that near full complete resolution. So there is an overlap between celiac and SIBO, and that's well published. There is a paper showing that antibiotics benefit the refractory celiac patient. What should I do with methanogens in the small intestine, but raised bilophila and desuvolfolbrio, ah, sorry, in my colon? <laughs> Okay, so methanogens in the small bowel, bilophila and desulfovibrio in the colon. Yes. Yes. Um, so I don't know if they've done a breath test, but it'd be worthwhile to do the breath test because, so um, this is where stool testing gets wonky. So we we did a study now about a, de about a decade ago where we looked at M. smithy I levels, which is the methanogen level in stool. So... You're constipated when you get to a certain amount of M. smithii in the stool, but when you get it high enough that it's on the breath, you're really constipated. So the breath actually tends to be a marker of the degree of organisms there. And when the breath test is negative, it tends to mean that the organisms aren't enough, or at least that's what we think, aren't enough to cause symptoms. Because it's like this, you know, if you do a PCR, I'm going to really get really crazy technical here. If you do a PCR, which is the most advanced way, kind of like the PCR for COVID, everybody knows that now, what, what the term PCR means, because we were doing it all for COVID. PCR, if you had even one virus there, it could pick it up. I mean, you know, it probably doesn't just pick up one because it's not quite that sensitive, but it's super, super sensitive. So almost everybody has a little bit of methanogens in their colon. So if you did a PCR on the stool, everybody's a little positive. So that doesn't mean you have... M. smithii causing your condition. You need a better thermometer. And methane is a really good thermometer. Now, what we don't know exactly is the cutoff in the stool. So you have the methanogens, but they're, if they're just above this point, that's when they're not good. Uh, we don't have that thermometer for PCR yet for stool um, to say, okay, if you took a thousand people, if it was above this point, you're constipated. Nothing like that's been published to my knowledge. Okay. But breath testing, we have a lot of data. Okay. Um, so I'd recommend for this patient, okay, good. check for H2S production because Bilophila and Desulfovibrio produce H2S. So I think that was what they were trying to get at. So. And the methanogens produce methane. And so you'd want to know where those levels sit. <clears throat> uh, well, we just said something that like would have answered three other people's questions, but I'm going to keep going here. Does having MCAS and other hypersensitivities, I do not, due to having that, I don't tolerate any of the prokinetics. Is there any value then in taking further treatment or elemental diet if I can't support my MMC? Go Gail, way to educate, nice. <laughs> All right, so, I mean, elemental diet does a lot of things. I mean, for one, it's hypoallergenic. So we know that in conditions that where there's too much histamine, too much eosinophil, uh, pr uh, production of histamines or uh, those types of chemicals and mast cells. Uh, if you go on an elemental diet, it cools all of that down temporarily. So elemental diet can be beneficial in MCAS. Number two, there are bacteria truly in as part of uh, SIBO, for example, Klebsiella, that does produce in some cases histamine, 
which then, you know, is like pouring gasoline on the MCAS eosinophil fire. Um, and so if you reduce those bacteria with an elemental diet, you may get a benefit, a secondary benefit. So, but you can't be on elemental diet forever. So it's not a long-term treatment, um, you know, and so you, you, that's where the prokinetics would have come in. Okay. Uh, do archaea feed on anything else besides hydrogen? And if so, what else might we need to focus on uh, removing to re or reducing emo? Hi, Meg. Well, um, there's a number of ways you, you can reduce methanogens uh, or methane production, I should say, is number one, you kill the bug. So we, we focus a little bit on that these days because we don't have anything else. Another is find the partners that are creating the hydrogen that feeds the methanogens. Well, we found those partners, they're Kristen Sinella and Ruminococ ACA, and we published that in a paper a year ago. So we know the partners. So if we get rid of those guys, maybe the methane can't methane bug can't produce methane. A um, little trickier because some, you know, some of the characters are in, in those categories of bugs are harder to respond to antibiotics. So maybe it's not going to be easy. The other is you just stop the bug from producing methane, which is really what we're working on to just don't kill the bug, just stop the methane production. Okay. Uh, do you have, what, how do you feel about these biofilm busters people talk about? Um, so it's, Again, another complicated story. I always say, give the same answer. Biofilms are helpful and harmful. <clears throat> it depends on who's in the biofilm and 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 all of that. Biofilms are act as a sort of a, a barrier to a lot of things getting in, uh, things that you may not want, but also it depends who's making the biofilm and what kind of bad things they're making that cause you problems. For example, E. coli and Klebsiella, the big players in SIBO, we showed in a paper a long while ago, that they love to live in the biofilm, which makes them harder to get at. And, and so um, there may be a role for biofilm busters there. Interesting. Have you heard of high dose sulfur for IBS? Recently heard Dr. Kathleen Janelle talk about this. Would love your thoughts on this if you have indeed looked into it. Um, so high dose, high dose sulfur, I haven't. Uh, I tend to think that, so one of the things we see is that as hydrogen goes up in the gut, the hydrogen sulfide producers follow along because they're like, oh my God, this is the most, this garden has the most vegetables I've ever seen and the rabbits are just multiplying. Um, <clears throat> and so that is always a concern. And if you add sulfur, then you've just given the fertilizer to the hydrogen sulfide producers. I don't know of any data that says it would work in, in my personal review of the literature. Uh, but I would be concerned that it might put fuel on that fire for the hydrogen sulfide producers, and maybe that results in more diarrhea. I don't know, but I'd love to hear what that person has to say um, more directly. Chris, bloating after 30 minutes after eating, but the breath test values only start rising at 60 minutes. What could that be related to? Another gas, CO2 from CFO, small intestine fungal overgrowth? Well, um, so what we what we know, this is the, the funny part about breath testing is that, you know, people in the beginning when we started this whole idea that IBS had a positive breath test and SIBO was, oh, no, the breath test is actually telling you how long the lactulose takes to get to the colon. And this is all colon bacteria. We've debunked all of that over time because and, and, and this is how the analogy I'd use if anybody out there makes bread. You put yeast in the water with sugar, and then you leave it, and then it forms a foam, right? And then you take the foam, and then you put it in the dough, and then you beat the dough, and then you let it rise for 90 minutes, and yada, yada, yada. So when you add lactulose to the gut, let's say you have overgrowth in the duodenum. The lactulose is going to go to the organisms. The organisms are going to eat it. The organisms are going to produce gas. That gas is going to build up in the gut until the gut gets enough pressure that it gets into your blood, and then it gets into your breath. And that takes up to 60 minutes. So the gas you're producing on a breath test right now started 60 minutes ago or th at least 30 minutes ago because that's how fermentation works. It takes time. It's not like oh, immediate. Uh, but what we did see in the study we published just in January was that when you have SIBO, 
you know, in some of our analyses, you in, in some of these patients, they have 63 times faster fermentation because the bugs there, the E. coli, they're just so good. I mean, they'll eat all the carrots in the garden before anybody else because they're just so fast at metabolizing carbohydrates. And so they can produce things faster than 30 or 60 minutes. But the point, the point I'm trying to make is it's not an immediate thing after the sugar. Even though you may feel bloated, that gas hasn't gotten to your breath yet. Okay. What what would you recommend? Uh, no, would you recommend the elemental diet for someone like me who has emo and is severely underweight? So, um, okay. So going back to the original paper that we did in 2003 on Vivanex. So Vivanex, which was the product we used in the beginning, was very effective at getting rid of overgrowth, about 80 to 85% of patients. And many of them were refractory to the antibiotics of that time, of course, was not rifaximin back then. And then um, we would, um, we were getting about 80 to 85%. We were getting about a 50-50 shot with methane back then. So we've been trying to see if we can get do better. And so the, we do have a new elemental that we worked on that's been now on the market for about a month and a half. And we're getting close to 75% eradication of methane in a short period of time on it. Now, all elementals suffer from the same problem. Well, this elemental suffers not from one problem. It tastes good. So that was one of the most important criteria. It's got to be good tasting. Otherwise, nobody's going to drink it. Uh, but they all suffer from the same problem of boredom of drinking liquids and people under drink the calories. And when you under drink the calories, you lose weight. So it's preferred that you try to take all the calories uh, that are prescribed to you so that you don't lose the weight. Um, but it's very good at getting rid of methane. Okay. Yeah, I can just second that, that we, if so long as somebody in my clinical experience drinks the proper amount of calories that's recommended, we don't see weight loss. Oh, what is the name of that elemental diet? Uh, it's called Mbiota Elemental. How do we... M biota, how do you spell that? M, the letter M B I O T A elemental dot com is the website. Okay, cool. I, I did include that in my last quarterly newsletter. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, and we did uh, we did the clinical trial on it, so you'll see data on that at the at the DDW meeting in May also, uh, because we not putting anything out till we do a clinical trial showing that it works. So you'll see a lot of data on that at DDW. And then the paper is being constructed right now. So we'll have that published shortly. Oh, great. That's exciting. And the link for that is in the chat, everybody. Um, I've been taking a prokinetic Iberogas for four weeks. How do I know if it's working? And related, how long should I take it before trying another? Basically, what is the time period period for determining success? Uh, less than a month. So if it's not working by now, I would say that one didn't work for them. And how do you define it? Like, how can we tell if it's working because we didn't get SIBO again? Or like, what? what is, how do we determine that? Correct. Uh, but what I, first of all, let me take a step back. My goal with my patients is to get them 80% better. Sometimes they come in and I say, what percent would make you happy? And they say 50. And I say, no, that's not my percentage. My percentage is 80. Um, so I'd like to get you 80% better. So we use a variety of you know techniques to, to figure out what's wrong, try to treat the underlying cause of the SIBO, uh, treat the SIBO, put them on prokinetics or whatever is necessary. But my goal within a month or two is to try to get them to that 80% feeling better window. And then the, then the challenge is keeping them there. Um, and, and that's, that's my goal. But if in a month they're not getting better or staying better or whatever, we got to move on to other things. I've had colon cancer cured. Now my, my doctors say my intestinal problems are from five and a half weeks of radiation. Mm, I'm so sorry, but I've been using hydrogen water every morning. Can that cause SIBO? Are you familiar with this? hydrogen water out there in the yeah. world? No, it can't. Uh, it shouldn't. It doesn't contain enough hydrogen to to be that, you know, that that kind of, if it's going to do anything, it might fuel methanogens, but even then the hydrogen comes off so quickly. I, I don't think it's enough. You, you need sort of a, a constant production of hydrogen to cause challenges in the gut in terms of the microbiome. So I, I doubt it. I doubt it's going to. Okay. And, oh, and the other thing, the other thing, just 
again, going into the weeds deep in the dark wow. forest of information. Uh, the higher hydrogen is, the more it inhibits bacteria, especially the hydrogen producers. So you can, so like, for example, the the production of hydrogen pickles themselves over time. Sort of like making sauerkraut. The bacteria die, and now you got sauerkraut, and you know the bacteria have done their thing. Same with cheese. They kill themselves by just continuously producing whatever they're producing. It's the same thing with hydrogen. And if you have methanogens there, they take the hydrogen away. So the bugs can just keep going crazy making hydrogen because they know somebody else is getting rid of it for them. So, um, you know, anyway, uh, just another side note. But I've never tried it as a therapy. It's just an interesting anecdote. Okay. Just a, a request. Please put your questions in the chat. Or no, not in the chat, but in the Q&A box. Uh, we have hundreds of questions, so I'm not going to be able to get to everybody's, but I'm doing my best. Typically, do many patients have low stomach acid with SIBO and EMO? Uh, I just had one last week, first one in two years that had low stomach acid. So it's not common, but it does happen. Um, so just you just have to be watchful for it. It's a little difficult to diagnose low stomach acid. And if you have low stomach acid or no stomach acid, as was the case last week, you got to watch out for there are risks for stomach cancer developing and you have to do a whole series of tests to look for h pylori no h pylori um antibodies to parietal cells and and your your doctor really needs to get involved at that point okay um do you see any relationship between long covid and sibo and then also lyme and sibo and when i'm saying sibo everybody i mean sibo emo just for the record yeah uh so i mean i'm a sibo Person. I see tons and tons of SIBO patients. I have not seen a bump in SIBO among my patients with COVID or the vaccine. I haven't seen a worsening of those who have SIBO because of COVID or the vaccine. Um, so we weirdly, and, and we actually studied this and published this, we saw that in the reimagine study during COVID, because people were eating at home, eating sensibly, not going out to restaurants because they were all hunkered down, their microbiome became more normal during the COVID because they weren't eating 10,000 different things a week because they were venturing out and eating at food trucks and other things. Um, so their microbiome became really nice uh, during COVID. Now, I'm not saying, they, but they also followed their low fermentation diet more because, you know, you go to a restaurant and you ask them, well, does it have this, that, and the other thing? They might not tell you the truth and then you end up having more symptoms. So we did see that for sure. Okay. What would be uh, the treatment if you have SIBO symptoms, positive antivinculin antibodies, but a negative SIBO breath test? So... Okay, it depends if they did the three gas breath test. I don't know if they did or not, because we generally always do the three gas breath test now to make sure. Um, and so I, I would just double check on that. But if they're positive antivinculin, it means that they had food poisoning and it's causing stasis in the gut. Um, I'm surprised that the breath test is negative because almost always they're positive. Uh, so something is something is wrong in that story. Okay, maybe a redo of the test might be a good idea in the three. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, could SIBO cause salicylate intolerance? Uh, no, I've never encountered that. Um, salicylates are actually antibiotics, believe it or not. They do inhibit bacteria. All ASA products can have antimicrobial effects. I don't think it's going to treat SIBO, so don't start taking aspirin every day. Uh, to treat your SIBO, but um, it can affect the microbiome. And we're, that's why the reimagined study is so beautiful because we can see all these different things, a lot of different drugs. You know, it's, this is what we're going to find is a, the, the definition of an antibiotic is going to change because so many things we take as drugs have effects on the microbiome. Metformin has effects on the microbiome just by the drug itself. But we don't call it an antibiotic because it was never categorized as an antibiotic, but it is changing the bacterial composition of the gut. So um, I think, you know, we're gonna learn a lot as uh, we continue to unpackage all the data. 
Uh, Olivia's on the 18th day of her elemental diet and didn't have bloating the first few days, but now getting bloating after consuming anything, the elemental diet or bone broth. So she's getting bloating after those. Does this mean the diet isn't working? Can I end it or do I need to keep on going? Now he's not your doctor, but I'm sure he yeah. has a comment. Uh, so basically what we do with the elementals, I'll tell you what we do because I can't directly tell, give people medical advice. Uh, we give them the elemental diet for 14 days. On the 15th day before starting food, we do a breath test so that we know if or they if or if not, they've eradicated. That's a little tricky because some of these mail-in breath tests take a few days to get back. Uh, but if you're if if you continue on the diet while you're waiting for the result to get back, we happen to have the breath test here as well. So we can do it in person just to check, especially if they have hydrogen or methane. But if they don't eradicate, we add a few more days. There's this leads me to talk about the after the elemental uh, is done. Everybody, it's it's un universal. They stop the elemental diet. They may or may not be feeling better, but their breath test is negative. And then they start eating and they say, doctor, this didn't work. I'm bloated, I'm bloated, I'm bloated. Every patient stopping elemental is bloated while they start the food back. And we think it's because the villi retract or contract. You know, it's like having a cast on your arm for two months, you open the arm and the right arm is tiny compared to the left arm because you didn't need the muscles. So you conserved energy and, and the muscles shrunk. Same thing with the villi in your gut. They shrink. You don't need them. You're not using them because the elemental doesn't get into that part of the gut. And now you're eating food and you need them and they're not there or they're lower. So you don't absorb the food quite like you're supposed to. So we say, and it, and it happens all the time, it happened yesterday in my clinic, no, Tuesday, sorry, uh, patient was done 10 days later. Now they're just feeling, oh my God, I can't believe how good I'm feeling. So when you come off the elemental, just 10 days before you make any conclusions. Okay. Um, any suggestions for European patients when neomycin is impossible to source, non-responsive to metronidazole and develop resistance to allicin? Um, maybe the elemental diet, I don't know. What, what, how do you help people in Europe? Any suggestions? Uh, Europe, Europe is, um, sorry, people from Europe, uh, it, it's, it's a real problem. Um, rifaximin is available in Europe for hepatic encephalopathy, but it's not available for SIBO or IBS uh, because, well, I, I'm not even going to say, but it has to do with the financials of making money off of rifaximin, uh, and that's all I'll say. Um, and they don't want to try to get it approved for IBS. Um, and maybe, you know, government officials and, you know, it's a socialized system, kind of like Canada, where I'm from, where the government is going to have to pay for a lot of people getting rifaximin and it could be very expensive. So there's a lot of factors that go into why rifaximin is so challenging in Europe. Um, you can get elemental in Europe and that that's something you can do for these cases where, you know, somebody can't tolerate an antibiotic or Allison or other products. So I would I would go in that direction if it was my patient. Um, a lot of my patients from Europe fly here, so they buy the stuff here when they come to see me. Uh, so that makes it easier for them. Right. Are you seeing patients? How long is the wait list? And I'm, I'm, I see a ton of patients, but the wait list is endless because I, I had to stop seeing news. Um, so if the CEO of our hospital wants a patient, I sort of have no choice, but, um, but I, I try my best, uh, to see as many as I can, but it's it's overwhelming. I'm sure. We thank you for doing everything you're doing. <clears throat> uh, do, do you see any correlation between high cholesterol and methane? Uh, we did, and we do. And we're checking with this, the new elemental diet, um, because we have, bio, we have, if you knew what we collected on these patients before and after, we're running through all of that to see if the cholesterol is going down, if the uh, hemoglobin A1Cs are going down, and a whole bunch of other things. But we do see obesity associated with methane. We've published on that a lot. And getting rid of methane might contribute to an easier weight loss. You still got to do the work once it's there. Um, but but it doesn't. It's not magical. It's not like making your uh, you know your fat or your obesity go away. Okay. Um, should I do the classic question? Should I do the opposite of a low fermentation diet while taking antibiotics? 
Uh, classic question. <clears throat> and this all started one time when I said it with Allison at a conference up in Oregon. Um, what you don't want, so the way I tell my patients now, if you're symptomatic with whatever you're doing, don't stop what you're doing. Don't go on the low fermentation, but don't stop what you're doing. But um, if you're you know, what I don't want you to do is necessarily make yourself absolutely miserable while you're taking the antibiotics. The, the concept here is uh, a well-fed bacteria is more susceptible to the antibiotic treatment. And so if you force feed them, like some people do guar gum or other things to try to get them to be all active and then to kill them more, yeah, maybe, maybe you'll kill more, uh, but you'll be miserable in the process. I don't know how many percentages you get extra just by doing that. So I don't actually recommend that to my patients. I just say, you're symptomatic. Whatever you're doing is wrong anyways. So just go ahead and take the, the course of Rifaximin or whatever the course is. Okay. Um, if someone has stinky farts, sulfury odors, can we assume that they have hydrogen sulfide SIBO? Well, I don't think you can assume anything. Everything from the colon is stinky. So, you know, think about it this way. If you're producing hydrogen and it's passing through all that fecal material before it comes out, it's picking up odor. So I'm not sure, you know, odor in and of itself is enough to make a distinction or to say to somebody, oh, you have hydrogen sulfide. So I, I mean, maybe somebody has a really good nose that way, but uh, I'm not sure you can make that distinction just based on your own self-examination. Okay. By the way, for those of you who are like, I'm catching some of it. I don't understand some of it. When you receive this replay, you're going to see all of the other sessions Dr. Pimentel has done with us, for us. So go back and watch a few of those because they are magnificent in spelling out everything, including the names of the bad players, as he calls them, in the uh, microbiome. And a lot of this will make more sense. I know a lot of you here are new. A lot of you have already watched all of those over and over again. And it's also on the SIBO SOS YouTube channel, but you'll also get a link to it in your email. Um, okay. Siobhan, Siobhan, yes. let me pop in with a question that uh, we get asked all the time, um, which is people want to know, how can they prevent getting SIBO when they have food poisoning? Uh, well, number one, don't get food poisoning, um, <laughs> which isn't always easy. Um, but, you know, the old dogma was food poisoning is going to go away. If you got it, just roll with it. Let it let it take its course. But I don't I don't do that with my patients. I mean, if they get food poisoning, I think they should take rifaximin specifically if it's E. coli. So the way food poisoning works is there's four major players, E. coli, uh, Shigella, Salmonella, and Campylobacter. And there was a beautiful study that was just done that ranked them. And, and, and I can't tell you the details because it's not published yet, but it's in, in process of being published by another group, not our group. Uh, but reflecting back on a previous study that was never published, Campylobacter is the worst. But once you got Campylobacter, Rifaximin doesn't do anything because the Campylobacter goes intracellular into the cells of your lining of your gut and Rifaximin can't get there. So you have to do Cipro or some other antibiotic to get it. So the best way is not to get it at all, which is sort of what I was joking about earlier. Um, but if you're going to places like Mexico or other places where E. coli is very common, E. coli can easily be treated with Rifaximin. And so that that's, that's a, a, a no-brainer. But for my patients who have antivinculin antibodies, for example, or who have bad IBS, SIBO, and are, are frequent relapsers, I do give them prescription Rifaximin, it's off-label, to take half a pill with each meal, and they will not get food poisoning. They will not get Campylobacter because you're killing it before it gets into the cells. Uh, at least that's my experience with that. Um, and most of the GIs in my area, they take it wherever they go. So they're, they've heard me enough to uh, be scared. And smart, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. right? Um, okay. Uh, can methane SIBO go away by itself if you find the root cause or will it always need to be treated? Well, you see, this is the, the thing about, you know, we, we, we haven't gotten too deep into it, but we know food poisoning and the CDTB toxin and the antivinculin, uh, anti-CDTB and antivinculin antibodies are a marker of that food poisoning. 
So we sort of know how SIBO hydrogen, SIBO hydrogen sulfide develops and our animal model proves that beautifully. So we give the animals food poisoning and the rats get either hydrogen SIBO or hydrogen sulfide SIBO. Uh, and that just sort of makes the point. We don't know why methane comes. Uh, we think it's because your parents had it, you got it, and then for some reason your level goes high or too high and then you get these symptoms. But we don't know that there's actually a trigger or like a, this is because this happened, you now have higher methane. We don't we don't see that. We don't know what's doing that. Did you just basically say that it was almost hereditary or genetic, but not really <laughs> like past? Uh, I would say it's environmental. You're eating the same food, using the same bathrooms, you know, and getting, you know, the colonized with the methanogens because your mom had it or your dad had it or, or, or that kind of thing. I think that's the way it's going. There are some twin studies. They're not really great twin studies that suggest if one child is away from the parent, they don't get the methane, but um, the you know, we need better studies to understand this. That's wild. Um, C. diff and antibiotics, which are the least problematic? The least problematic antibiotics? Uh, any of any of them can cause C. diff. Flagyl, uh, flagyl or metronidazole is a treatment for C. diff. Rifaximin kills C. diff. Vancomycin kills C. diff. But you don't typically use any of those for like a urine infection. So um, it's tricky. You're going to have to consult with your doctor before you get any kind of antibiotics. And you certainly, the ones that are always considered the worst violators are clindamycin, which we don't use much, um, and sometimes doxycycline, which we don't use much either these days, except some people for acne and, you know, skin issues. Doxy is what you're saying? Yeah, doxy. Yeah. And tick tick-borne things too, right? Right. It's sinus. It's number one for sinus. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Um, You've got to be careful. The dog C. diff's terrible. Horrible, horrible. Um, did you just say FMT for C. diff? Is that possible? We, we didn't go there. We didn't go there, but okay. Okay. you want to go there? <laughs> yeah, let's go there. Yeah, C. diff, you could die. So let's just address it briefly. Okay. Um, what's going on with the medical state of Fecal microbiota transplants. Okay. So the medium story is um, fecal microbial transplants work very well for C. diff. Fact. Uh, open sourced fecal transplants were being used and the FDA was monitoring that and were being used successfully. Fact people were getting superbugs from some of those stools because the curating the stool, we didn't know, people didn't know what to curate, except you don't want HIV, you don't want hepatitis viruses, you don't want these kinds of things in, in the people who are donating the stool for which you're getting it. But then, you know, you don't know if they have a superbug or not. You don't know, you know, because they, they don't look for every single thing. They just look for, for infections, right? Uh, we published a case in, using open sourced uh, stool where somebody had C. diff diarrhea and they got methane from the, a methanogen producer. And now they're off the charts constipated and they wish they had diarrhea because the constipation is worse than the diarrhea. So that happened. So the pharmaceutical industry came out with two products, which are recently FDA approved. One is from Ceres Therapeutics. Um, the trade name is uh, Voust, V-O-W-S-T, but it's a consortium of spores that you, you take as a capsule, they colonize the gut and they're supposed to, you know, keep the C. diff in check. Uh, the other is from Faring and it's called Rebiota and that one is actually fecal material from extremely well curated samples that the FDA has approved the curation and and it's administered during colonoscopy or as an enema, I should say. Uh, and both are quite successful at treating C. diff. Uh, and that's where we are with fecal transplants. And less and less people are getting open source fecal transplants. Okay. Any thoughts on what, that's a lot, thank you. Is Any thoughts about if the FDA will be approving rifaximin for constipation anytime soon? 
Uh, I don't think so because nobody's looking to get it approved. The, if the FDA doesn't approve it without somebody saying, "Hey, can you prove this, please?" If you don't ask, they don't they don't do it. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, yep, that was Refaxman. Any other tips if you do get food poisoning? How do you feel about charcoal? You know. Well, does... anything that you know. Uh, what I do believe is true is that if you take Imodium, which helps slows the diarrhea down. You're just retaining those bacteria longer, and that that is a fact, um, and that can prolong the illness. So you'll stop the emodium, and all the diarrhea is still back because the Campylobacter is just not coming out; it's staying in there because you're plugging the you're you know putting a cork in it. Um, so it's best not to do emodium, you know, unless you're there for meetings and you can't miss the meetings, or it's a wedding and you can't miss the wedding, you know. So take a modium if you need it, but try not to, I think, let it all come out um, as bad as that sounds. Okay. Um, for uh, colonoscopy prep, there's some talk about how there's some new prep treatments or, you know, prep, like low volume pills. So what do you, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? You know, um, there's always a new colon prep coming out. Um, it's so hard because it's it's hard to improve on near perfect uh, because most of the preps work very, very well. Uh, patients don't necessarily like the prep, but who likes to have diarrhea? The fact is you can't do a colonoscopy unless you have watery diarrhea and clean everything out and there's no good roundabouts. Um, so, you know, if it's low volume, you have to drink more water. So it's a concentrate. If it's high volume, you drink less water, it's all mixed in already, you know? So uh, I don't know. To me, it's they all sort of work the same and and I have my favorite and that's what I do. I'll share... never forget when I was uh, watching you do a colonoscopy and we saw the watermelon seeds there. Oh yeah. So I, I'm just shocked how many people eat watermelon because I see <laughs> watermelon seeds all the time. And then they say they were fasting. So somebody was sneaking watermelon in, in the middle of the night to these people. Okay, so watermelon, beans, corn, vegetable fibers, just things that are hard to digest, right? Yeah, exactly. But but you just follow the prep that your your gastroenterologist gave you for the colonoscopy and and uh, I don't I don't think any one is so much superior to the other per se, but it some people like others, some versus the others and okay. it's just the way it is. Thoughts on the Dr. Davis yogurt? <laughs> And if you don't want to answer, that's fine. I'm just putting it out there. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, no, I don't. So this is a new one on me. Supergut, super gut, William Davis. He calls it SIBO yogurt. Calls oh, it SIBO. I haven't heard of this one. All right. He wrote a book and he swears by a very specific yogurt uh, that you make at home with a specific strain. Um, okay. Because Robin's daughter followed the yogurt for several months, had flu, didn't eat, so moved right into the elemental diet. Right after, has had six weeks of fungal ear infections and very thick fungal-like scalp issues. Could that be from the ED diet? Could there be a yeast overgrowth or something? Depends on the ED diet. So the way the new one is designed, the one I mentioned earlier that we're, we did studies on, nobody got fungal uh, overgrowth. But Vivanex, we would see fungal, we would see thrush in a lot of patients who are taking it. Um, but there's some design elements in the new one to try to prevent that. Um, and I mean, can't really talk about it because they don't let me, but there there are some design elements in there. So it must've been, uh, yeah, they gotta, I gotta know which one they took. Okay. I think it, Robin, if you wanna pop that in there into the Q and A box. Um, can we talk about traumatic brain injuries and concussions and SIBO? Yeah, I I see this occasionally. Um, we have patients with traumatic brain, brain injury that, you know, um, some of them, we, we do vagal testing. Uh, the way we do vagal testing is called a, a sham feed test. Probably never talked about this on the call before. Uh, to see if the vagus is intact. And you can damage the vagus nuclei in the brain through brain injury. You can damage the tracts going along the neck uh, with the neck, you know, uh, movement. Um, and so this is how you do it. When you think about food, your pancreas starts to turn on and that's through the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve tells the pancreas, okay, start making the good stuff, getting ready for food. 
when you put food in your mouth, then that jacks up even higher. And when the food gets into the stomach, that's even higher, highest. But you want to test the nerve. So the best way to do that is to get people to chew food and spit it out. Don't swallow even a bit of it. And that's called a sham feed test where they're eating the burger, but spitting it into a bowl beside them and never swallowing it. Um, and then when we see that the pancreatic polypeptide levels in the blood do not rise by the correct amount, that means the vagus isn't working, both vagus nerves. Uh, so we do test for that. And if the vagus nerves aren't working, if you have sort of that vagotomy situation, you can get SIBO. So we test, I don't know, we probably do two of those tests a week, uh, maybe one or two a week. Um, but there's a lot of reasons you can have it. Uh, you can have it because of, of surgery went wrong uh, when they do fundoplications for reflux. They put it, made it too tight or the nerves got entrapped in there and they got cut off. Um, heart transplants, uh, you know, you can lose your vagus nerves. So we test those kinds of patients. Uh, Robin's back with the elemental diet information. We thought the amount of quality of glucose created the issue and she was on physician's formula, which I think is- uh, High glucose elementals can- I mean, there's other things that you can put in there to balance that out, which the MBiota has. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, it can happen. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. Hold on. You guys- the reason I'm jumping I in with a question while Siobhan's looking, because yeah. this is the one, another one we get all the time um, about semaglutide and terzepatide. I know you've answered it before, but we've got new people. Um, can, can semaglutide cause SIBO? or worsen pre-existing SIBO? Number one, number two, and number three, you can't treat SIBO when they're taking these drugs because nothing's leaving the stomach. You'll take the rifaximin, it'll sit in the stomach. You take any drug you want, it'll sit in the stomach. It ain't moving anywhere, so useless. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is it's kind of a mixed bag. We don't actually know exactly. It slows these GLP-1 agonists slow the gut down entirely. So if you already have a slow gut and SIBO, yeah, it could make it worse. But at the same time, you're not letting food out of the stomach at all. So you're starving the bacteria of the gut. So mm -hmm. we haven't tested enough of these. First of all, yeah, we haven't tested enough of these people to know. But then how do you test these people? We do a breath test on them and the lactulose never leaves the stomach and you have a flat line breath test. So you can't even test them with a breath test. So the answer is, we don't know, we don't know, and we don't know, uh, but we can speculate. And so that's sort of what I've done with this answer, uh, because the breath test is useless if you're on these medications. Do you think that you can uh, have them take the tests, the more, if, you know, it's a weekly dose usually, the morning of that they're going to take it? I mean, I know it stays in the body for a couple of weeks, but still, or is it useless? Yeah, I mean, it's just... You know, you, you're going to, if you get a funky result, you're not going to know what to do with it. You're not 100% sure. Um, normally, the way drugs work is, you know, you, you get the drug going up and then you're catching it going down and then you give the second dose. You want to give the second dose before it reaches the bottom so you don't get the breakthrough. So there's never not drug in there, um, even if it's at day seven or whatever the, the next dose day is. So hard to know. Um, yeah, we see a lot of weird breath tests on these patients. Okay. Um, any thoughts on Alinea with, as a SIBO treatment? Uh, well, I, I've never seen a study published in a journal on it uh, that I that I can recall. Um, but, you know, it's nitazoxanide has similar properties as metronidazole, and metronidazole has about a 25% chance of getting rid of SIBO. So, but some people say that they get better results with methane. Um, I can't say I've never used it because I have, I have used it, um, very expensive. And in some cases it, it's worked. So, um, yeah, don't have a broad experience with it mostly because it's too expensive. Okay. We are wrapping up. Please put some love into the chat for Dr. Pimentel. Thank you for taking the time to share your information with us. And we are all praying for you and Godspeed and good vibes and happy, happy, joy, joy. Thank you so much. Please, everyone, go and we have an encore free to see what Dr. Pimentel contributed to, as well as Dr. Allison Seebecker and Dr. Ali Razai to that Gut Rescue Summit. 
And then when you, we send you the replay, you're going to see all of Dr. Pimentel's talks that he's done for us over the years. They are phenomenal, great slideshows, lots of background information. And um, we will see you after DDW. Yes, I look forward to that. Thank you. And following you on X or Twitter is a great idea. And oh. I see that you're um, you're getting out there in social media more, which is awesome. And we just are really excited for all the progress that you all are making. Send our love to everybody there at the Mast Lab. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And uh, thanks for all the work you guys are doing too. Got to get the word out. Got to get the yep. word out. Mark, take care. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thanks so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It was a delight. And we look forward to next time. And Dr. Pimentel, we're going to just keep chatting. So you go do you. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Isn't he amazing? And Dr. Ali Razai was also just so amazing. And Dr. Seebecker is so amazing. You all are such a great team and coordinating the information and getting it out to people and treating people and teaching people. So I'm not kidding. When you go and get this replay, that's going to come to your email later today. Go back and look at a few of these intense masterclasses that he's done for us. It, it, he spells out the from the food poisoning, the other underlying causes, and then map of the small intestine microbiome. It's beautiful. And it will really, really help, I think, fill in a lot of gaps. A lot of your questions, I, could, I just couldn't ask him. I mean, we had hundreds, but he's answered them so many times before in those talks. And the, so I went into some topics that he doesn't usually talk about, like the C. diff and the FMT and some of the other things. It was a balance for sure. And I appreciate you all. And thank you very, very much, Dr. Seebecker and Clarissa behind the scenes and my entire team. And with that, it is a wrap. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Clarissa, you good? Okay. Oh, I don't think we got our screenshot. But also, we are doing small group coaching with Dr. Allison Seebecker. If you are interested in that, you can email us at info at SIBOSOS.com. It's limited to 10 people per session or per group. It's a group of four small group coaching. We also have the SIBO Pro course. If you're a pro and really want to get to become a SIBO expert, she also has two mini courses if you're a pro. And then also the SIBO Recovery Roadmap courses if you're a patient where the protocols are all taken through. You're taken through all the protocols. So anyway, just wanted to let you know about that. The date, Ramona, for the DDW update. I have to look, I don't want to overpromise this because his schedule does change sometimes. And like, I don't, I don't know when it is. Hang, it might even be July, but let me tell you, yeah. Right now, don't hold me to this, everybody. It is the 17th of July, one to three, nice two hours Eastern time. But let me say this. So you're probably gonna see him on social media talking about what he's talking about at DDW before then. But here's what happens when we wait a little bit. This is very strategic. He has even additional information that he can release. That's historically how it's been. And it's been so cool because we've gotten like additional inside scoop. So that's why we didn't like pressure to be like, oh, we want to do in June. We wanted to let him have us take a little break, breathe. What else you been up to? And then in July, we're going to do that. Okay. All right. Um, Jason, I didn't have the resources financially to have a FAQ page for all of his questions. Um, that's a great question. That's just a really big financial investment. You can get transcripts done of the talks um, if just doing otter.ai. Um, and we just haven't broken it down like that. But his talks are so good. They're going to answer a lot, a lot of questions. Okay, everyone. Take care. Thanks so much. We will see you soon. Okay, bye.